context matters. Uh, just to remind you, because we've been talking for a long time. This is 69 days uh, of this new board that we're actually talking about. A new set of uh, directives that were announced by the president in the SONA in February. And thirdly, that uh, this was one of the key institutions that was at the heart of state capture. And so each time you begin to peel this large onion and take off a layer, you can see the level of excitement it causes of the positive kind and not so positive kind. And I'm sure you can decipher that for yourselves. Part of that uh, excitement is the skeletons that he's looking for. Um, I thought in, only in anatomy classes in medical school you'll find skeletons, but he's discovering skeletons here. And that needs to be understood as well as a process. It's a process as, for example, each contract is looked at what, whether something, a service was delivered or not, as in the case of McKinsey and Trillion, very little seems to have been delivered, or the pricing was uh, at an overcharged rate, uh, or invoices were submitted without valid uh, services being offered or goods being offered. The second point after that would be to say, did we get value for money if something was delivered? The third point, if you didn't get value for money, how do you recover that money? Right? The fourth, if there's criminality involved, then the board must take the necessary steps to go uh, to the relevant authorities and lay the charges. But the fifth is laying charges is one thing. Having people actually prosecuted is quite another. And that's the issue that I think in the interactions between the board and the management and the relevant authorities uh, needs to be taken up. Otherwise, there's no credibility given to the work, kind of work that is going on here. The second set of points is the, the kind of task that this board was given uh, when it took over in January 2018 in three broad categories. One, tackle the financial issues, including the corruption issues. Two, stabilize this institution, both in operational terms and in financial terms as well. And three, begin to ask the question, what should ESCOM look like in maybe two years' time, four, three years' time, four years' time? Uh, both in terms of its business model and in terms of the kind of uh, organizational shape it would have, and how is it going to respond to the technological and other changes that are happening around the world and embrace them in some way, uh, but also minimize risk on the one hand and uh, increase the sustainability factor. And that's why you have this theme of transition to, to sustainability. A related point is that both at the board level but also at our department level, uh, including the ministry, we, we can't have any valid oversight, uh, nor can we tell the public that we are uh, actually doing proper oversight over institutions if we actually don't understand the business of institutions. Not as much as the professionals here uh, that are engineers or CAs or whatever the case might be might understand it, but you need to understand at least the basics of this business and the industry in which it actually operates uh, before we can say that we actually have proper oversight. And I think that's one of the weaknesses that we've got to overcome as, as we go forward. So the board has reported today what they've been doing on corruption, but this is going to probably go on for another 18 months or more as uh, more effort is put into this process. And certainly we're going to get to a point where more charges will be laid. But organizations like Trillion and others should know that the game is up. The information is out there in the public domain. Don't they want to uh, also go to the NPA or whoever, confess their sins, and return the money uh, that is due to ESCOM? Uh, at least that's one example that McKinsey might have set in the, in the positive sense. Uh, the second is that we've got to rebuild investor confidence. And I think the answers from the CEO and the acting CFO and the chair have uh, given you an indication of how they are going about it. And you can see that post-January, uh, there has been more access to funding. There's a greater de a deal of confidence in the, in the organization and in the board and management as well, and in, in government more, more generally as, as we go forward. But in addition to that, uh, from a departmental point of view, but also the board's point of view, we are executing uh, and putting into practice in concrete terms 
the mandate given to us by the governing party and by the, by the government, which says, as the President indicated, governance will be strengthened, boards will be changed where that is appropriate, corruption will be rooted out, uh, the way in which boards are appointed will be changed so that we have the right mix of experience, skills, uh, women and, in, and younger people who should get opportunities to be exposed to uh, this kind of practice. Uh, boards should not be involved in procurement. None of you asked the question, but that's one of the steps that they've taken, that there will not be any direct interference or interventions in the procurement process. And this is happening in other SOEs as well. And, and that's the, the, the first of many steps that need to be taken to overcome, if you like, the sins of the past, because boards and others played a key role in ensuring that uh, the inverted commas right people got the business that they should have got at that particular point in time. Uh, external audit processes need to be strengthened as well, and I think we are all familiar with the fact that the audit profession has its own challenges, uh, both here in South Africa, but internationally as well and uh, more rigorous standards need to be applied uh, within those firms so that uh, we can get a true reflection of what's going on. And the question has to be asked at some stage. Where were the auditors all these years when these uh, corrupt acts were actually going on? And uh, whom do we hold accountable uh, for the oversights, if you like, rather than the oversight that they should have maintained on behalf of the South African public uh, but uh, government as, as well. So th those are, I think, some of the deliverables in very concrete terms that you've seen uh, this board uh, put, put forward before you. So what do we want at the, at the end of this process? What we want is an efficiently operating ESCOM, whether it's on the generation side, distribution side, uh, or transmission side. Uh, and by efficient, we mean do, do the best that the system is capable of doing, but also maintain the system uh, in all three respects at a level that would not uh, create difficulties for our economy as we've actually seen in, in the past. The second is that the costs structure and the cost in this organization must be brought under some kind of control. You cannot have this imbalance between costs on the one hand and revenue on the, on the other hand. If you look at some of the numbers, I mean, in revenue terms, there's been a massive increase from, say, 2007 to 2017. Uh, 39 billion was what the revenue was in 2007. 177 billion is the number you saw today. That's a huge increase. But it's not an increase in volume of electricity sold. It's an increase in tariffs. And the accompanying question and responsibility that the board has in the broader context of South Africa uh, and uh, management has as well, is that my other colleagues in government are asking the question, how are these tariffs going to be affordable for business? On the one hand, in the National Development Plan, we say that we want to reduce the cost of doing business in South Africa. Electricity is a key cost in the manufacturing industry, in the mining industry, and other industries as well. So how do we maintain this balance from an ESCOM point of view? but also from an economy point of view. I think we're getting the same issues coming back at us from citizens in, in this country and households. Because we also say to citizens in the National Development Plan that we will reduce the cost of living in South Africa. But electricity is a key household cost as well. So I think what, what we are hearing today is the beginnings of a process uh, to ensure that both the external factors and the internal ESCOM factors are going to be taken into account as, as we look at some of these issues. Thirdly, the, the revenue issue is, is key. Revenue must match expenditure. Uh, at the moment, there is a total imbalance between the two, and the, what the technicians will call the EBITDA, uh, or the margins that we are making from this particular business, is actually being used uh, to pay uh, interest on debt or debt servicing costs, whereas that should be met from revenue and what additional money we make in this organization should either be invested uh, or at some stage, Mr. Chair, we need to look forward to a dividend from ESCOM uh, to government. And, and because that, that's the standard that we should actually start using. Um, and so the relationship between tariff increases, volume increases in sales, 
and what we recover from the RCA or from the tariffs for IPPs are the overall balances that we actually uh, need to look at. The, as I say, the borrowing should be as you go out. In the short term, we'll have to do what we have to do to stabilize the organization. But in the medium term, borrowing should be for investment uh, in, 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 in the different parts of, of the business, particularly in the transmission area and the distribution areas as, as well. Um, the developmental mandate of ESCOM is one that often we don't uh, refer to uh, in specific terms, but it is to support uh, industry and business in South Africa uh, in, a, in a way in which it is cost effective and uh, where small businesses and others can begin to, t to thrive. On the other hand, the electrification of households is an important uh, mandate that ESCOM has also got. Uh, from the Department of Energy, which pays them to actually uh, overcome some of these challenges that we have. And lastly, as, as we go into the review of all of the contracts, that will also be work, into, work in progress. All major contracts in ESCOM uh, over the last couple of years that have been entered into should be reviewed. Do we still need the goods or services? Are we getting it at the right kind of price? Is there an inflation, to put it politely, uh, number that has actually been added? Uh, and if so, how are we going to re-engineer uh, these, these contracts? And we expect the business community with whom ESCOM does business to be supportive of this process at, at the end of the day as well. So in sum, they, 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 these are uh, exciting but difficult hurdles that we have to in, uh, overcome. And I think it's in the interest of workers in ESCOM, but workers in our society as well, small and large businesses, uh, particularly our mines and, and uh, industries, where we say we want to increase the manufacturing component of our GDP and the middle classes as well, that ESCOM does succeed in its transition to sustainability and that we all play a part as partners uh, in this particular process. We need to come up with an IRP that suits our situation, enables us to execute a, a just transition and uh, get to a place in five or ten years where we can say, we have the right balance and the right mix as well.